I'd like to acknowledge the um, traditional owners on, on the lands on which we're meeting today. Um, where I'm coming from is uh, the Tarabul and Yagara peoples, uh, and acknowledge that these are spaces that have been places of learning, teaching, and discovery for tens of thousands of years. I'd like to extend my respect and pay my respect and um, acknowledgement to all traditional peoples, past and present, um, and extend that to, to elders past and present as well. So today I'd like to introduce um, Professor Carolyn Evans, uh, Vice Chancellor and President of uh, Griffith University, uh, also Rhodes and um, Scholar and Fulbright Scholar. Um, and she's going to run us through uh, her experiences um, with the uh, with scholarships in the past, prestigious external scholarships in the past, um, as well as her, uh, um, uh, uh, give us an overview of its importance to Griffith University. Um, thanks so much, Carolyn. Well, thank you very much, Rhys, uh, and thanks to you and all the team in the Honours College and many staff around Griffith who do a fantastic job of supporting our scholarship applicants. And those scholarship applicants are current students, alumni, uh, and indeed, in some cases, staff members as well, particularly for things like the Fulbright. Can I join with you in acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet? Uh, I'm here on Kumameri and Yugambeh land uh, down on the beautiful Gold Coast, and I too pay my respects to Elders past and present, and I hope we're being joined by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students um, here who are thinking about scholarships uh, because we've certainly seen some terrific success, uh, including for people like Sasha Purcell, who was the first Torres Strait Islander to win a Fulbright scholarship. Hope I've got that correct. Uh, thank you also to those who are going to be joining us um, tonight from the different scholarship organisations. We're really grateful to you for your time uh, and also to the people who are talking to us from the broader group of the community, particularly those of you who are taking the time to come from overseas, sometimes in some not so friendly time zones. So it's really great that you're giving support to the next generation coming along too. I'm just going to give a little overview of a few general issues at the start before you hear more specifically from people from the different scholarship plans. So the first thing I want to say is congratulations. Like, well done on taking some time out of your busy life to think about the next stage, uh, whether it might be an appropriate time for you to consider applying for a scholarship, consider studying overseas, uh, thinking about what you want to do with your life. And I want to say to you, my key message tonight is that this is a great thing to do, regardless of whether or not you are ultimately successful in getting a scholarship. Uh, and I say that really sincerely because the reality is most people who apply for most scholarships don't get them kindly outlined some that I did get, but of course I applied for heaps of scholarships. I didn't get most of those scholarships. I know plenty of talented people who've applied for scholarships and haven't got them. Uh, but nonetheless, most of them have found it a really good experience in their life to stop, to think about what they want to do with their life, to think about the difference they might want to make in the world, to think about what they have to offer. Uh, to the community, to the global community, to the local community, and to think about how they need to stretch themselves to ensure that in the next stage of their career, the next stage of their development or life, they are going to be prepared for what uh, contribution they might be able to make. And a scholarship and studying overseas is one way of doing that. But I suppose coming uh, right on the tail of that and fairly logically is saying, don't put all your eggs on one, in one basket. Um, there are many, many great people out there in Australia and a limited number of scholarships. So have a plan A. You, you might desperately want to get the roads and go to Oxford. And that's great. Go for it. Go hard if you're eligible and, and you know, really do it. But think about, all right, if I don't get that, what might the next stage be? We're talking to you about some of the big national uh, and international scholarships tonight, but you might think, no, I really want to go to a particular university in Scotland. Uh, you know, let's have a look at what options they might have open. So have plans A, B and C. Think about what you might do in Australia. Good scholarships for PhDs uh, for Australian students in Australian universities. Uh, sometimes a really good experience there. Don't get Griffith in your consideration of those things. Um, but you know, make sure that you've got some things to fall back on. Uh, and finally, I'd say as you're preparing for most of these scholarships, do take it as a time for self-reflection. Genuinely think about your strengths. What have you done well? What are you outstanding at? What might you need to improve on? Think about the things, not that just you can do and that you will benefit from, but of course think about those, but think about how you can show your somebody that the people who chose you for the scholar in 10, 20, 30, 40 years time might look back and say, yeah, we made a good decision on that. 
that person has gone on not just to be successful in their own right, which is lovely, but they've gone on to make a serious and real contribution to the communities that they're part of. We're really proud of how well our Griffith community has been doing in these scholarships. We do outstandingly well in the new Colombo plan, one of the best in the country, often the best in the country in terms of the fellowship. We've got people at the moment uh, in the last couple of years who've been on Fulbrights, both staff, students, uh, oh, actually, and indeed alumni. Uh, we've got some Rhodes Scholars. We've got um, scholars in really almost all of the major scholarship programs now. So have the confidence to go out there, have a go at doing this, this is great for you. It's a great life experience. I know plenty of people who haven't got scholarships who said, you know, it was still one of the most interesting and exciting periods of my life, particularly if you've got an opportunity to be interviewed for those. Um, and others still who found the period of reflection really useful, even if they didn't get to that interview stage. Do your best. We'll do our best to support you because there is no better advertisement for Griffith, no better way of building our reputation globally than for people to have the opportunity of seeing fabulous group of people in action in the great universities overseas, being an enormous success, making a real contribution to those universities. So thanks for joining us tonight. Really do um, think about your career, think about your future, think about how a scholarship could help with that. Uh, and we will try and do our best to support you in whatever decision you make. Reese, thanks very much and back to you. Thank you so much, Carolyn, um, and, and really wonderful words there yeah, that um, uh, I think will be reiterated throughout tonight's session. Um, to start us off from um, uh, one of um, uh, Carolyn's uh, um, wonderful uh, 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 scholarships is Tara um, Holly Whitfield from the Australian American Fulbright Commission, um, and she's here with Tanner Noakes as well, and they're going to be running us through um, the the uh, Fulbright Scholarship. Hello, um, Tara. Hi, Reese and Professor Evans. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm so thrilled to be able to join again for this program and talk a little bit about the Australian American Fulbright Commission. Uh, I'm joining you from the not so sunny Sunshine Coast today in Noosa, so just like to extend uh, my acknowledgement to the Kabi Kabi people uh, and extend that acknowledgement to, to any Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander people joining us uh, today for this call. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard about the Fulbright program, I'm only going to give a six minute snapshot about what this program is. Um, but please know that there's a, a full uh, 40 minute version of this available on the Fulbright website, which might give some more detail that I might not be able to cover today. But just really quickly, just about the Fulbright program, it's uh, it's a 73 year old program here in Australia. It was uh, set up post World War II by a senator whose face you can see on that slide there, who had the idea that if people just spent more time together, if they spent time understanding each other and understanding each other's cultures, then things like World War II wouldn't happen again. So his idea was really about the idea of transformative cultural exchange, so real immersive diplomacy. And so he took some funds from surplus World War II supplies and turned that into a program which now operates in over 160 countries all around the world. So the Fulbright program specifically is an exchange program that works with the United States. So if you are looking for an opportunity to conduct research or study in the US, then Fulbright is the program for you. I'm only going to spend just a couple of minutes here, but just if, if Fulbright is a name that you may have heard, it may just be bouncing around that you think you've heard that somewhere, just to say that Fulbright is one of the, the largest and the most prestigious scholarship programs in the world. But just because you heard me say prestigious, please don't um, rule yourself out. Words like that certainly don't sit with, with me and how I think about myself, but it's prestigious in that, in that it has a wonderful long history. Um, it's open to all fields of discipline and study and research. So whether you are an artist or you're a scientist or you're a lawyer, whatever it might be, we have a number of different scholarships that are available. And because it has such a, a well-regarded history, it's, it's a program that can really um, not only be transformative on the experience itself by, by offering a chance to go and conduct research or study abroad, but of course these opportunities are designed to help boost your career in the, in the future, connect you with people from all over the world, and, uh, and really invite you to be a part of what has been uh, an, an exciting and wonderful legacy to date. 
the Fulbright scholarships, we have a number of them, which I'll get into the categories, which is going to be something that's probably more of interest, but they range in value of anywhere from $30,000 up to $500,000, depending on what type of scholarship you undertake, and they have a range of benefits included. More information about this is probably best suited uh, on our website, so just have a look there, and I'll give you some contact details at the end of this presentation. Now we offer about 100 scholarships a year, which is huge. When I started with the Fulbright Commission, we were offering about 30 scholarships a year. So in the past years, we have more than tripled in size. And that 100 scholarships are split across a range of different categories. The first one being postgraduate, which I'll come back to in just a moment. Uh, but for anyone here who has completed their PhD, it says within the last five years, but we're extending that to within the last eight years. Just noting that I think all of us can say we had a career interruption in the last few years. So if you completed your PhD within the last five to eight years and you'd be looking for a research opportunity in the US for up to 10 months, have a look at that category. We also have our scholar awards, which are available to uh, senior lecturers, associate and full professors, and also those who may sit outside of academia who have 10 years relevant professional experience. And these allow um, opportunities of three to four months in the US. I have one at the bottom there, which is, which is a distinguished chair, which is very specific. So I won't spend any time on that one, but feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to discuss it. Coming back to postgraduate, for us, postgraduate can mean one of a few things, which is it might be you if you are interested in going to the US to complete a full master's program for up to two years. It could be you if you would like to go to the US to complete a full PhD program, but it also could be you if you are currently enrolled in a PhD program, but you'd like to spend a shorter period of research in the US that's related to your current PhD program. Now, again, all of these scholarships, regardless of which category might have spoken to you, are open to all fields and disciplines, and there is no age limit. There are just some citizenship requirements, which I'll come to right at the end. Not going to spend any time on these, but just to say that when we say there are up to 100 scholarships available, there are lots of different ones available in each of the categories. And when you apply, there's a checklist that you can complete and you can tick the box to be considered for all or just some of the opportunities that are available. And just a tip from me that if you can tick as many boxes as humanly possible, it just means that we can consider you for as many different options as possible. But there are one, two, three, four, five, just scholarships just on that slide for postgraduate, but they represent more than 50 opportunities. Same here for postdoctoral. There's just a number there on the screen just showing that there are a number of options available to you and you might be eligible for more than one. And then just because the text gets smaller, the same again for our scholar awards. One to point out though, regardless of category, please just make sure you check out the Fulbright Future Scholarships funded by the Kinghorn Foundation. We just say that because these are the most generous of our uh, opportunities, particularly if you are a degree seeking student. Quick note here, just on the application components, please check out the, the longer recording on this, which just outlines what sort of information to include in which section. I won't go into that here, but that, that webinar that's been pre-done is just great about trying to break down the information and how to cover everything in, in what is actually quite a short application. And then just to highlight here that the Fulbright program, forgive me, my dog is shoving a, a tennis ball just behind my back. Um, that the Fulbright program, our office is only able to accept applications from Australian citizens. Unfortunately, we are not able to accept applications from permanent residents. If you hold dual citizenship with any other country that's not the United States, then you're also absolutely eligible to apply. There was one slide to take a screenshot of. It's just the selection criteria that's here on the screen. They're the four uh, pieces of selection criteria that we look at and we weight them equally. But again, that extended webinar will go into great detail about what that includes. And just a note about the application timeline before I wrap up. Applications are open right now uh, and they're open until the 5th of July at 11.59 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. So I'd highly recommend if, if Fulbright even just, just tickled your curiosity to have a look and start an application as soon as you can, just to make sure that you've got enough time uh, as possible. After applications close, we do interviews between August and October, and then we notify um, applicants by the end of the year, and then they can begin their programs the following year. Just some contact details there for more information. Always great to access the website. Uh, I'm also on that email there, which is fulbright at fulbright.org.au.
And before I hand over to uh, Tana Noakes, who was just recently selected in our um, most recent round of Fulbright Awards, which um, was just at the end of uh, last year. One thing I did want to add, just based on the presentation from Professor Evans this, um, just earlier, is that every um, successful recipient I've ever met from a scholarship, the one thing they thought is that they were never going to be successful. You know, they really didn't believe it and they were so shocked and amazed that that, that success had come through. So back yourself and throw your hat in the ring because you never really know what's going to happen. So put your hand up for this opportunity for all of the opportunities tonight. And if you need anything, please feel free again to reach out to me just on that email address that's there. And Tana, if you're there, we'd love to hand uh, over to you. Hi, Tara. Um, it looks as if Tara, uh, um, Tana might have been uh, held up for, um, or something along those lines. So. Um, perhaps we could throw over to a Q&A now. So if you have any questions um, for Tara uh, about the Fulbright, and thank you so much for, for running us through those details, uh, please feel through to, free to put that into the chat. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come through, Tara, um, can you run us through maybe, uh, I guess, the Tanner's um, experience? Uh, and is that typical of, of everyone's experiences? What, would, uh, what did Tanner under, undertake to apply for this? Um, what made him successful and, and what did that lead to? Yeah, sure. So Tana applied as a student who's seeking to complete a degree. And it's probably a great a great time to say that if you are someone who wants to complete a PhD or a master's program, when you apply for the Fulbright program, you do not need to have confirmed uh, your admission at a US institution at the time of application. So you can apply first for a Fulbright scholarship and then all of our successful applicants then work with a team of placement services which are based in the US and, uh, and they work individually with our candidates and they help them do all of their college applications. So don't think you need to first um, have a whole range of um, college admissions before applying. So for Tanner, he applied first. He let us know really clearly what it is he wanted to do, why he was so passionate about it, uh, what it was he was hoping to achieve, how it fit into his career trajectory. And then he applied by the due date in early July and he was interviewed by, a. we used panels of between three and five um, individuals from different disciplines and backgrounds. So another tip for me is when you're writing your application, make sure you're writing for a really wide audience. So if you you are in science, give it to your friend who is in the arts and make sure it makes just as much sense to them as it would to someone who's in your discipline. So Tenna, his application was stellar. It was really clear. It was really clear why the US, why the degree, how it all fit in and how it was going to come together. Um, and even though he had applied, yes, the year before, his passion and dedication certainly shown through. So I suppose um, if Tanner was with us, he would say, if not successful, throw your hat in again because it's certainly worthwhile. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that. And we have a few questions um, coming through on the chat now. Uh, Christopher asks, how early in one's undergraduate degree should one consider applying for the Fulbright Scholarship? Yeah, sure. So because our scholarships start at postgraduate uh, and then move up through, I don't know, academic stages or professional stages. You cannot apply for a Fulbright until you're in the final year of your undergraduate degree. And if that is you, if you are in your final year, you'll just need a, a letter or a document to attach to your application that just confirms that you are on track to graduate. So if you are successful, you would be heading to the US in August 2024 if you're there to complete a degree program. So we just need something from Griffith confirming confirming that you would have graduated by that time. Thanks so much for that, um, Tara. Uh, we have another question here from Yasmin. So when you apply, do you have to nominate where you want to study or can you choose that later? Yeah, sure. So Yasmin, if you want to complete a degree, you do not need to have an affiliation at the time of application. So that's if you want to do the full PhD program or a full master's, no affiliation needed. If you fit into any of the other categories, so whether that's as you're in, a, in, you're in an Australian PhD and you want to go and do research or you are a postdoc or you are applying as one of our scholar awards, those you need to have secured affiliation at the time of application. And all that requires is a letter from your potential host that confirms that should your application be successful, they would be happy to host you. And this part seems to freak people out a little. They think, I don't know anyone in the US. How am I going to convince them to host me? But just remember that Fulbright is the largest 
scholarship program, particularly in the US, it's got 75 years worth of history with 160 different countries. You'd be hard pressed to find an academic in the US who hasn't heard of a Fulbright. And remember, you're not asking them for financial support or for visa support. So all you're asking is, if I was successful for a Fulbright, could I come and spend that time in your office, in your lab, in your whatever best suits um, the research you would like to undertake? So whether that's connecting through, uh, we have campus advisors on our website, particularly for Griffith University, people who've said, let me know if, if um, there are candidates who want some help with their applications, whether that's through the research office or whether that's just cold connecting with people that you would love to work with, you do need that letter for your application. So research, you need affiliation, degree, you don't need it at the time of application. Again, thanks again, Tara. And I think we have um, enough time for one more question. Uh, and it is a bit of a tricky one, so we're putting you on the spot here. Um, okay. Tanya, <laughs> Tanya asks, um, I'm currently a dual citizen, US Australia, uh, but will be renouncing my US citizenship in uh, on the 21st of May. Uh, and should have a certificate to this effect by the end of June. Would this allow me to apply for the Scholar Award in the 2023 or 2024 cycle? It would, Tanya, but just send me an email at fulbright at fulbright.org.au and we can just unpack that a little bit further. Right. Thank you so much again for your time today, Tara. That was um, really illuminating. And uh, hopefully those of you who are interested in, in um, looking to, towards an opportunity in, uh, with a Fulbright scholarship um, have uh, got a bit of information there that, that's helpful to you. Um, have a great evening. Thanks again, Tara. Thanks. Uh, we'll throw over now to um, Professor Stan Hearn, uh, State Secretary of Rhodes, Queensland. Stan, are you there? I am. Can you see me? Yeah, you're coming through loud and clear. Excellent. So shall I just slide the slide the slides on a couple of are. places? OK, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, coming to you from uh, a rather bleak and wintry Lutruwita, um, Tasmania. Uh, the last stop before the South Pole is where I am at the moment, um, in uh, the Huon Valley. So uh, the land on which I'm speaking to you from is the Palawa people, so I pay my respects to them. Uh, so I am currently the State Secretary of the Queensland Rhodes Scholarships. Um, I'm a time series econometrician, and I, I have been at QUT for quite a long time. So I'm sure that all of you will be dying to hear from your own, very own Catherine Woodward, so I'm not going to be talking to you for very long, um, but I think I should probably just say a few things about the Rhodes Scholarship. It's a slightly more tightly circumscribed than the Fulbright. It was really interesting listening to the previous uh, um, presentation because the Rhodes is slightly, slightly more circumscribed in terms of the application process. Um, interestingly, in June of this year, uh, the last weekend in June, it will be the 120th anniversary of the Rhodes Scholarship. So an amazing, an amazing track record, really. So what is uh, the Rhodes Scholarship? So it's a fully funded, full-time postgraduate award for you to go and study at Oxford. Okay, it is only held um, in association with Oxford. There are no other universities involved. You go to Oxford for full-time study for at least two years, um, and you can study any postgraduate course offered by Oxford. So there is a possibility to extend the scholarship for a third year, um, uh, but that is really uh, by negotiation with the, with the Rhodes Trust and dependent on your course. So we encourage applications from talented students everywhere and it is an amazing opportunity to go and work at the greatest university in the world and I say that um, having been to Oxford myself and not being biased it has been rated number one for the last five consecutive years in the university ratings so um, it's an amazing place to go to go and work. What does the scholarship cover? 
it um, pays all your university and college fees. So that part of the scholarship you don't actually see. That's just handled by um, Rhodes House. They pay all your academic and college fees behind the scenes. That's for your tuition. You then get a stipend. And from your stipend, you obviously have to meet your living expenses. Um, and maybe Catherine can speak to this a little bit later. But in my time back a long time ago, um, that stipend was paid at the beginning and end of each term. So I particularly liked the idea of getting the uh, stipend at the end of the term because that allowed you to travel during the um, the Oxford holidays. Um, and that was a very, very nice um, aspect to the scholarship. Being so close to Europe, you can just hop on a train and end up anywhere you like. Um, it pays the costs of an application to study. It pays for health cover. And uh, I was just reading over the next bullet point a short while ago, and I realized that that could be interpreted uh, incorrectly. It, it actually buys you flights to the UK and back from the UK. Um, it doesn't give two round trip journeys, which you could read into that bullet point if you're trying to uh, find a loophole. Um, the settling in allowance is new uh, since I since I undertook the scholarship, um, but um, I think that all in all, it's incredibly, incredibly generous and comes in depending on the actual fees. It's somewhere between seventy five thousand and one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year, which is an amazing, an amazing gift for your future. Um, the one thing that you should note is that the scholarship can't be deferred. So if you apply and you're successful, you have to take it in the round that it's offered to you and you cannot hold it in conjunction with any other scholarship. OK, so are you eligible? So our eligibility rules are quite strict, um, but I'm delighted to tell you that in a major, major new development this year, we have made the applications open to refugees and asylum seekers. Um, in general, you have to be an Australian citizen or permanent resident, but for this year, for the first time, applications from refugees and asylum seekers will be accepted. You must have completed two years of schooling at an Australian secondary school. Um, and critically, you must satisfy the age criteria. The age criteria comes in two parts. If you have a kind of a traditional straight from school to university kind of pathway under your belt, you have to be under 24 when you apply. The rule is you have to have not turned 25 by the time that you go up to Oxford. And as this, we're now accepting um, applications for the 2024 scholar, you need to be um, under, under 24 years when you apply. Um, in exceptional circumstances, if you have had a non-traditional path to university and you're, ex you're expecting your first degree to be on or after July 2022, then you can be 26 when you, um, when you apply. In terms of your GPA, uh, the, fundamental, the fundamental eligibility criteria for Oxford is academic excellence. So we give a guideline here of 6.75 out of 7 or higher. It's getting very difficult to get into Oxford, and so to be competitive, you really have to be up around that kind of level. That said, uh, Rhodes House are pretty good at uh, looking at track records um, and disentangling a minor hiccup from um, a major catastrophe. So uh, if your GPA falls slightly below this, but it's demonstrated, but you have some something there that demonstrates, actually demonstrates academic excellence, don't be put off. Apply. Um, so, so long as somewhere in your CV you can point to the fact that you were academically excellent, that is uh, sufficient at the moment for you to consider applying. And please um, get in touch either with me or the state administrator, Mandy MacDonald, whose details um, will show you on the final slide. If you're unsuccessful, you're allowed to um, apply again uh, one time. So you're allowed two bites, um, but you have to apply at, in, the, in the constituency in which you applied first. So for example, if you choose to apply in Queensland, um, and you're unsuccessful, next time you have to apply in Queensland again. You can't hedge your bets and say you're going to give New South Wales or Victoria um, a shot. So there is one Queensland Road Scholar chosen every year. Um, and if, in the opinion of the 
um, selection committee, you do well enough, we can suggest, we can put you forward for um, Australia at large selection. And there are another two Australia at large scholars that are selected every year. So um, unlike the Fulbright, it's, it's a much smaller, it's a much smaller grant in terms of um, Queensland. So what are the selectors looking for? Um, as I've said, first and foremost, academic achievement and excellence, but different to other scholarships, Rhodes looks for three other characteristics. The first of these is energy. And by energy, um, it means using your talents to the full in whatever your field is. Um, it used to be a uh, thought that this, this um, applied only to sports and to a mastery of a certain sport, but in fact that definition has been broadened over the years. Um, and so music, debating, dancing, any kind of artistic endeavor, singing, choir, um, all of these things, so long as you can show that you have dedicated yourself to it over a period of years and that you haven't just decided to take something up and then, um, you know, basically thrown it away, tried something else. So there needs to be some demonstrated mastery there to show um, your use of energy. Then there is truth, courage, um, and devotion to duty, normally um, evidenced in terms of things like unselfishness and your um, devotion to the community, your dedication to the community, your willingness to get involved at a local level. And finally, there's um, the instinct to lead. So to take a instant, not only to take an interest in your fellow human beings, but to show leadership. So those are the things that the selectors look for. Now, I, I should I should emphasize here that um, the panel, um, when it shortlists and interviews people, are really trying to look at all of these things in a relative to opportunity kind of framework. So I want to encourage everyone even though you may not um, believe that you have a chance because of interruptions to your career or because of things or because of your background and you haven't had an opportunity perhaps to do the kind of um, community service that other people uh, might, might suggest is important, what we try very hard to do is to assess um, your application relative to opportunity. So do um, consider throwing your hat into the ring. Some quick key dates for you. Um, applications open on the 1st of July and close on the 8th of September. Um, the most important things to remember about the application are that uh, you need to find five referees, three of which are academic and two of which are character. So that's something if you're thinking about applying, you should start thinking about now. And if you have any, um, any questions about that, then again, please get in touch. So, to get in touch, you can email me at uh, the email address shown there, or you can get in touch with the state administrator, Mandy MacDonald, who is um, at the Rhodes Queensland address. You can also vis visit our website at uh, www.qt.edu.au forward slash Rhodes, um, but you could also just Google Rhodes and get onto the Rhodes House site. They have a, an amazing site set up with lots and lots of um, very helpful stuff in terms of applications. So I think that's enough from me. Um, Catherine, if you're somewhere out there in the ether, then perhaps I should hand over to you. Uh, okay, I am here. So hopefully you can Excellent. see me. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm Catherine. I am calling you from a kind of dreary Oxford this morning. Um, we have been having bursts of sunlight every now and then as we start to get into spring summer, but it keeps going back into rain, which is unideal, uh, given that I've had a lot of that over the last six months and I'm ready for some sunshine. Um, but I just wanted to have a very quick chat to you today. Thank you for having me along um, because it wasn't really that long ago that I was at the other end of this conversation. Um, so I am one of the newest scholars here. So I'm part of the 2022 cohort. I've been in Oxford for or oh, maybe seven or eight months now. Um, and before that, I was a Griffith student. So I did my undergraduate at Griffith. I did my postgraduate at Griffith. I worked for nine months and then I came here. So um, for the most part, um, I spent most of my academic life uh, right where you are, 
Um, and it was really only through the Rhodes process that I was able to think about other opportunities that lay a bit further afield um, and then ended up moving to the other side of the world, which has been the adventure <laughs> that I didn't necessarily anticipate. Um, but yes, so in terms of the Rhodes Scholarship, um, I decided to apply when I was in my final year of medical school. Uh, so I did a Bachelor of Medical Science and then my MD um, on the Gold Coast. And then as I was coming up towards the end of medical school, starting to think about what my career would then look like. As many of you who have dialed into this call probably are thinking, um, what's next for me? As a MD student, medicine and working in the hospital was the logical next step. Um, but it wasn't necessarily exactly what I wanted to do. I talked to lots of people kind of coming up into the last two years of medical school about what other opportunities lay out there. Um, and it was in all of those conversations that I ended up having a chat with someone who said, you know, Catherine, I, you did, have you ever thought about doing more study? And I was like, well, yeah, I've thought about it, but it seems awfully expensive to do another degree. I've already done two of them. Um, and then she's like, well, what about if you apply for a scholarship? Have you thought about the Rhodes? And I didn't really know anything about the Rhodes Scholarship at that point. And the first words that came out of my mouth in that conversation was, that's for fancy people. I don't think that's right for me. Um, you know, I had heard the Rhodes mentioned in context like presidents and world leaders. And I was a 23-year-old university student who grew up on the Gold Coast. Um, but I kind of explored a little bit more. I guess the seed was planted. Um, looked into the different eligibility criteria was slightly terrified that I wasn't going to meet the age criteria and it is quite a strict cutoff. So if you are kind of on the cusp of whether or not you're going to be um, too old, um, look into that sooner rather than later. But if you do meet the age criteria, then um, I would highly recommend you considering applying because it's certainly throughout the whole process I've realised it's not necessarily for fancy people. Um, it's for people who are really dedicated and passionate and want to make the world a better place and as part of that journey to get to that point, uh, they'd like to undertake some further study. And that's really what the Rhodes Scholarship is there to do. It's to find young people who have a lot of potential and try and help them to succeed. Um, so, yeah, you know, Bill Clinton did not start get, become a Rhodes Scholar um, when he was, uh, sorry, I don't know if I just got cut off. My mother's trying to call me. Um, this is our kind of time when we have overlap with um, time zone issues. Um, sorry, everyone, um, you know, everyone who takes up a road scholarship is young. You know, they're in their early 20s um, and they haven't yet gone on to change the world. Some of them do, incredible. Um, but, you know, I don't think that you should look at all of the kind of Rhodes alumni and judge yourself by that standard because, you know, they've had an extra 20 years to figure themselves out. And I can tell you as one of the many road scholars here in Oxford, my many friends who are we're still doing the figuring out part of all of that. Um, but, you know, I think the important thing is having an idea of where you want to be. You don't necessarily know exactly how you're going to get there. Um, and that's kind of what Oxford allows you to explore um, during your time over here. So uh, the application process is quite involved. Um, uh, Stan mentioned you need five referees, which is a lot, um, particularly when you're, you know, having to manage and get everyone to send their letters in in time. So if you're thinking about applying, maybe start thinking about the referees part in the first stages, contact people, even if you don't have a fully kind of fleshed out application yet, just flagging with um, those people who you think will probably be your referees early is better. Um, academics are very busy people. Um, so if you can have a chat to them sooner rather than later um, and you know get their thoughts and uh, advice as well is, is really helpful. Um, and then, you know, give it a shot. I, I think the recurring theme that sounds like it's probably going to come in from a lot of the sessions tonight is that most people who apply for these opportunities don't actually expect to get them. Um, you know, there's a lot of really incredible young people in Australia um, who are applying for different opportunities. And yes, these are very competitive programs, but someone's got to get it. And if you haven't applied, then it's not going to be you. Um, so, yeah, in terms of the practicalities of the scholarship, Stan, Stan mentioned they cover all your fees, um, which is fabulous because Oxford is a very expensive university to attend. Um, they give you a stipend. They now do it monthly, though, Stan, so you 
kind of have to think about saving your pennies a little if you want to go do your European summer trip. Um, but uh, you do have kind of access to a whole range of opportunities both within the university. You know, you'll have incredible speakers just in different um, lecture theatres every other night, um, but also the opportunity to kind of travel, explore, meet new people um, for me has been really incredible. Um, the academic requirements are uh, quite intensive. So, you know, you do have to balance your study and, and it's important to think about what degree you are going to be wanting to study as a Rhodes Scholar and that's part of the application process as well. Um, but not only what you want to study for kind of your own benefit, um, but how that's then going to serve the community. Because I think if there's one thing I can get across, it's that Rhodes is an incredible opportunity that's more than just about your academics. There is the academic requirement, um, but that's really just to ensure that you get into Oxford. What Rhodes really wants to be able to do is um, find really passionate and talented young people and invest in them. So um, unlike most scholarship opportunities, which are going to be really heavily focused on your academic work, your publications, your presentations, all of that kind of thing, Rhodes is interested in that, but it's also really interested in what else you do. I'm not a sports person and I'm not really a musician. I dabble, but I'm not going to say that I'm excellent. Um, so for me, I um, had done a lot of advocacy work and I wasn't really sure whether that counted um, because it wasn't, you know, playing for the national um, team in some kind of sport. Um, but it definitely counts. They, they look at everything that, you know, you've done in, in your kind of extracurricular as well as your academic life um, and, uh, so, yeah, definitely don't rule yourself out just because you don't think that you fit the exact mould of what a Rhodes Scholar maybe used to look like because um, it definitely has been evolving with time. 120 years has seen a lot of change in the Rhodes Scholarship, thank goodness. Um, we now have incredible young people from all over the world. So um, if you are interested, please reach out to someone at the university. I know that when I was going through the um, process, the Honours College was really incredibly supportive. So definitely talk to them um, and uh, see if it's something that's going to work for you. I Thanks so much that. for that, Catherine. Yep. Um, sorry for interrupting your, your um, cool time with your mum. Um, my apologies for that. We'll try and finish up soon so you can get back to that. Um, we have one question. We just have a, a short period for, for Q&A, but we do have one question that's come through from Jordan. Hi, Jordan. Um, and he asks, uh, what interested you specifically about the Rhodes Scholarship? Um, I think that there's obviously the opportunity to study at Oxford, which is you know, what the Rhodes Scholarship is designed for, um, but also the opportunity to become part of you know, an international community of young people from all over the world um, who are studying all different things. Um, and that has been one of the one of the parts of the scholarship that I've most enjoyed since being here. Not only do I have my college community, my you know, academic course um, classmates, but I also have the Rhodes community and being a, a part of that is really incredible. They have an amazing offering of kind of um, events that go on throughout the term. Um, they have a character service and leadership program that they try and really um, kind of develop your skills. Um, and, and that has been something that's quite unique about the Rhodes Scholarship um, and that I think sets it apart, beside the fact that it's obviously incredibly old and well-funded, which is also useful. Thank you so much. And thank you for your time uh, tonight, Catherine, and to Stan uh, and running us through um, the, the, the amazing Rhodes Scholarship. Thank you so much for that. We're going to move on to the John Monash Scholarship now, uh, and I'd like to introduce um, Sarah Ranatanas uh, from the General's uh, Sir John Monash Foundation. Hi, Sarah. Hi. I just want to check if this is working. I think it is. Excellent. Um, hi, nice to meet you all. My name's Sarah. I'm from the General Sir John Monash Foundation, and we provide um, John Monash scholarships. Um, so before I begin, I'd just like to do a quick acknowledgement of country as well. I'm here in Melbourne on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that we have people in tonight's meeting from all over the world of Australia, hopefully. <laughs> um, so as you might be able to tell through our name, um, we embody the values and the spirit and the guidance of General Sir John Monash. Um, so the foundation takes its name um, from him, a famous Australian who contributed to almost every level of Australian life. 
Um, not only do we carry um, Sir John Monash's name, but we also take inspiration from his philosophy as captured um, by the quote on this very slide. He was a man who used education to turn his natural talents into ability, allowing him to release his daring ambitions. He was a great leader, a scholar, academic um, and war hero in Australian society. Well, that's a little bit about me. So I'm the marketing and comms manager at the foundation. Um, and I work at a foundation like this because I believe um, in promoting um, and empowering young Australians. So it's a really amazing place to work in that regard. So a little bit about our scholarship. Um, it's uniquely Australian um, and it's open to any discipline and across any fields. Um, there's also no age limit for applying and we encourage applicants to select world leading institutions um, that best suit their studies and desired areas of impact wherever they may be. So we do have scholars um, from so many different universities. We have scholars that usually go to the same ones, but then we've had scholars who um, have just been the only scholar to ever attend there. Um, and we don't really mind um, where it is. And there's no real change in funding as well, depending on where you go, except for specific universities um, that have affiliations with us, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail later. Um, one of my favourite things about the John Monash Scholarship is the John Monash Scholar community. Um, so like mentioned in other scholarships, it is a community of scholars from all around the world. Um, and they've told us that, you know, that has been one of the biggest benefits is just having um, this huge bank of connections and networks and um, being able to leverage opportunities from others, but also have lifelong friends has been really great. Um, and if they do go to the same university, um, they usually collaborate. And, and things like that and sort of help each other along the journey as well, which is super great. Um, we also do, um, we, uh, we provide ongoing career support and professional development opportunities for our scholars. Um, we've just created something called the Leadership Academy, which kind of facilitates those professional development opportunities um, during and post your studies. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit later as well. So eligibility, um, there aren't many fine details here. It is extremely broad. You do have to be an Australian citizen and have completed studies or about to complete a degree from an Australian university. You have to be planning to undertake postgraduate study at an overseas university, um, commencing in the calendar year following the year of the application selection. So if you're applying this year, um, you're applying to be a scholar in 2024. Um, you can defer. Um, it is uh, on rare um, important circumstances, um, but that would be only for a year. So if you are applying, um, just keep in mind that you're probably going to be going in the following year. Um, where you choose to study, um, we do say it can be anywhere in the world, but you really have to identify and clearly articulate exactly why you've chosen that specific university. Why is that university um, the most special or the most enduring for you to really maximise your capabilities in your chosen fields? So one of the things, a few of the things that we really look for in the application process um, is excellence. So obviously, you know, your grades and your, you know, publications, performance, all of that sort of thing. Um, again, similar to the Roads and the Fulbright, it is just so that we know you will be able to form um, to, you know, suffice academic standards when you are um, accepted into that institution because you are representing yourself as a John Monash Scholar. I'd say the biggest thing, though, that we really look for um, is leadership. And I want to emphasize on that description because it doesn't just mean that we look for, you know, people who walk into a room and they, you know, tell people what to do. That's not our definition of a leader. Our definition of a leader is somebody who can really amplify and lead direction and sustainable change within their chosen fields and really be that um, representative that is that specialist that is driving change and ambition towards solutions to make Australia a better place. That is probably one of the leading things that we look for. So during the application process, you may see a lot of questions around leadership, but it's more just about how will you lead change, positive impact and things like that um, by being a John Monash Scholar and by studying what you've chosen to study. 
Um, and citizenship, obviously, um, you have to be an Australian citizen. We do hope that um, your studies abroad, um, a lot of the idea is that you will come back um, once you have completed your studies and contribute to making Australia a better world. Um, that's not to say that you can't choose to stay abroad. We have a lot of scholars that don't come back after their studies and live abroad and make those sort of life decisions, but they are still in ways connected to Australian community and they are still creating um, positive impact in Australia, even though they are living abroad. So um, logistics, what is the John Monash scholarship worth? So at the moment, it's 70,000 Australian dollars per year for up to three years. Um, and this is sort of how you choose to spend it. Obviously, the first instance, you'll need to cover your tuition fees. But because um, we have scholars from choosing so many different institutions, um, this can really vary into how you spend it. So um, I have a scholar um, in this current cohort that's chosen to study somewhere in New Zealand um, and $75,000 a year is more than enough for her. So she's also chosen to cover living, expected, living expenses, insurance and other things like that. Um, or else we do have scholars, you know, who go to Harvard or Oxford um, and $75,000 Australian per year is actually not enough to cover their full tuition fees. Um, so they will go looking for alternative sources of funding as well. Um, and we do have um, some restrictions around what other scholarships you can carry while being a John Monash scholar. Um, and we can get into more detail about that and you can always contact the foundation just to double check. Um, but all of that's kind of explained in greater detail during the application process. Um, we will help you with your return flights to and from Australia at the start and the end of your degree. Um, and we will also help you um, if you ask or if you're sort of looking for additional sources of funding, we can definitely point you in the right direction um, because we obviously have a lot of contacts and relationships in those areas. Um, and something new that we've created, um, we will give you lifelong membership for the John Monash Foundation Leadership Academy, um, which I mentioned earlier is essentially our professional development, networking, um, opportunity hub um, for John Monash Scholar alumni. So there are a few additional benefits, including that $75,000. So we do have affiliations with a couple of universities listed on this slide. So if you are looking at um, these specific universities, there are specific fees um, that are also included as an additional bonus, um, just because we've got a really good relationship with them basically. And these universities are really eager to get um, John Monash scholars enrolled. Um, the Wiesman Institute of Science, for example, is a full fee waiver. If you are a John Monash scholar, this still, all of these benefits with these affiliated universities um, still mean that you get the 75,000 just like everybody else. Um, that will never change. Um, but if you do choose these ones, again, in the application, you really just have to explain why you think this university is the best um, for what you want to do and achieve. Um, we also have um, named scholarships. So we have specific funders who fund um, for specific types of scholars. One of that includes, um, listed on this slide, the Roth Legal John Monash Harvard Scholarship. So this particular funder has said, I'm happy to fund a John Monash Scholarship, but I want them to go to Harvard um, just because I went to Harvard and I want to continue on that legacy. Um, and that's our decision. So if you've chosen Harvard and you're successful, we can potentially name you after that funder. It's very complex. A little bit more detail about the John Monash Foundation Leadership Academy. So we have an ongoing commitment to nurture and support our John Monash scholars in taking action against the real challenges we face today. The Academy facilitates the John Monash Scholar leadership journey by creating a platform for engagement within the community across all sectors. So this includes things like a mentor and mentee program, professional development events and opportunities, collaborative grant funding and more. Um, and the Academy is governed by an eminent advisory board and our patron is the Honourable Julia Gillard AC. 
So a little bit about a timeline as well. So applications for this year just opened last week. They open on the 1st of May and close at 11.59 on the 14th of July. Um, candidates are then selected for the first round of interviews. Um, interviews nationally are held between August to September. Um, there are three rounds um, and the third round is the national and you'll probably have to come to Melbourne or Sydney for it um, and it will be um, less of a pool of candidates. So candidates selected for the national interviews are held over two days in Sydney or Melbourne each October, and then um, scholarships are awarded annually, offers are made in October and November. The online application, first and foremost, will be a one-stop shop. Um, so it kind of looks like a bit of general information, academic summary, um, experience, leadership, engagement and impact, um, your own personal statement and referees, we ask for three. Important dates to remember, they just opened. Um, so if you are thinking about it, I really encourage you to apply and applications end on the 14th of July. If you have any more questions, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to info at johnmonash.com. All the information's on our website. And if you subscribe to our newsletter and social media, you'll see some amazing stories of what John Monash scholars are currently doing and hear about all our upcoming opportunities and things like that. Thank you so much for that, Sarah. Um, if you have any questions for Sarah about the Sir John Monash um, scholarship, please uh, feel free to post them um, in the space. Oh, we've already got one in there. Um, so Caitlin asks, uh, are there any scholars who have gone on to study music or the arts? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yes, there is. There's at least one every cohort. We have 15 to 20 um, scholars per cohort. We would have more, but it's just, um, it really is just a numbers game and we don't usually get too many art scholars applying, um, but we've had so many amazing art scholars who have gone on to do um, such incredible things. So I really encourage you, the more diverse, um, the more likely you might have, to be honest, because we really look to make sure that we cover a breadth of industries and disciplines um, so for example if you know we're trying to cover all bases and it's business and it's science and it's medicine and it's arts and we only have we have a hundred people applying to do an MBA but we only have one arts um, I think you know you might have more of a chance of, of getting in just because it's a low number but it really is anything and everything you can choose what you want study where you want and be whatever you like. Um, you just really have to explain, um, you know, why you've made the choices that you have um, and how you're going to use whatever you're good at to make Australia a better place. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Miriam has asked, um, has said that uh, she hopes to study medicine and would like to apply for the scholarship. Um, should she wait to see if and which university she gets into first before applying? Um, for medicine or should I apply up for the John Monash scholarship I think he means or should I apply for it anyway um, even if it's before the results come out? This is a fabulous question I'm so glad that you asked it because um, I ask scholars this all the time because it's a very careful dance um, if you get in to your institution and you apply for a John Monash scholarship but don't get it that's something you have to consider if you apply for a John Monash scholarship and get it and don't get into your chosen institution, that's also something you have to consider um, because we probably won't hold it for longer than a year, if at all, um, depending on your circumstances. So I recommend applying for the institution or multiple of them at whatever time it opens. And when the John Monash Scholarship opens, applying for that as well and just being, you know, hopeful that everything sort of aligns. But it is very much like you just have to make sure that you, you apply for both and hope that both work out. Um, like majority of the other scholarships, it's, yeah, I would just apply for the scholarship when it opens, um, but then I would, yeah, I would also be applying for the schools and institutions. Um, we can help in ways. I mean, saying that you got the scholarship in your application might be really beneficial. Um, and if there's anything that we can do in terms of like, you know, adding a reference letter to your application, if you are a successful John Monash scholar, um, there are ways in which we can support. Um, so, yeah, if you can apply um, just to study at your institution at the same time, I would try and do that. 
fantastic. Thank you for that. I'm sure lots of people have more, more questions there, but we might have to move on as we're now out of time. Thank you so much for your time to, uh, tonight, Sarah, and um, for, for providing all that information. No worries. Uh, we'll move on now to welcome um, Naomi Stinks. Uh, Naomi is the uh, manager at Ramsey Post, uh, is a Ramsey Postgraduate Scholarship with the Ramsey Scholarship. Um, good evening, uh, Naomi. How are you? Good, thank you. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you to Kim and Reese and the team at Griffith for arranging this information session. I'm, I'm always thrilled to join and it's been wonderful to hear it from everyone so far. And there's such valuable advice coming through and for some amazing opportunities. So thank you to everyone who's spoken before me. As Rhys mentioned, my name is Naomi Spinks. I manage the Ramsey Postgraduate Scholarships here at the Ramsey Centre and we're based in Sydney. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the scholarship opportunities that we have and then I'll introduce uh, one of our current Ramsey Scholars, Dr Grace Borchert, who is currently based in Oxford and she'll share a little bit about her experience later on. So. The Ramsey Postgraduate Scholarships are for high achieving candidates who have been accepted into a graduate program abroad at a world leading university. Since our program began in 2021, our Ramsey Postgraduate Scholarships have been awarded to 51 Australians who are studying in the UK, the EU, Canada and the US. The scholarships have been made available through the generosity of the late Mr Paul Ramsey, who was a leading Australian businessman and philanthropist. He wanted to support outstanding young Australians, our future leaders, to undertake graduate study abroad. Paul Ramsey was known as a man for others, who wanted to give back to his country and fellow Australians. He was profoundly grateful for his life opportunities and often reflected on the influences that had shaped Australia. He saw our nation as one of many that had benefited from being part of the long continuum of Western civilization. In particular, he wanted younger Australians to appreciate and value this heritage and to take the lead in passing it on to others. We have two categories of scholarship on offer. Our World University Scholarship, which is for any overseas university for any degree valued, um, and that's postgrad and that's for postgraduate study, and these are valued at ninety thousand per annum. And our second category is our St John's College Annapolis Ramsey Postgraduate Scholarship, and that's valued at up to seventy five thousand dollars per annum. Um, as an overview, applicants will need to be Australian citizens or permanent residents um, and have secured a place in a graduate program abroad before finalising their application. Uh, we'll have up to 25 scholarships a year on offer and the majority will be awarded in the World Universities category. Scholarships are intended to cover living costs, tuition fees and other related expenses. Next year, our application portal will be open from the 1st of February until um, sometime at the end of March. So if you're interested in this scholarship, keep an eye out on our website for the um, portal closing date and any updated key dates that you might like to make note of and, and, and keep in mind for next year. So firstly, our World University scholarships um, are available for any postgraduate study at any world leading overseas university. Uh, for example, we currently have scholars studying at Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard, Georgetown in the USA uh, and MIT, just to name a few. Schol these scholarships are available for one, two and in select cases, three years of coursework and or research, and they're not limited to a particular field of study. So by way of example, in the last two scholarship rounds, we received application from, applications from a broad range of disciplines, including but not limited to the following, uh, economics, law, applied mathematics, population health, literature, theology, archaeology, music, classics, film, fine arts and curatorial studies, education and philosophy. So there's a broad range that we accept applications for. 
Uh, if you're interested in reading about our current scholars and everything that they're doing, uh, we have all of their bios on our website. So our second category is the St. John's College Annapolis uh, Ramsey Scholarship, and this is available for up to six Australians a year to undertake a specific degree. It's the Master of Arts in Liberal Arts, uh, or the MALA uh, for short, at St. John's, and this focuses on the great books of the Western canon. So at St. John's, uh, there's a unique education on offer. Uh, great books and great discussions are at the heart of the college's distinctive liberal arts program. Students are part of an intellectual community from conversations around the seminar table to those that take place beyond classroom walls. It's a very enriching experience. St. John's is the third oldest college in the US and Annapolis, where it's located, is just 30 minutes from Washington, DC. Students have been reading the great books since 1937 there, and the low student ratio, which is uh, seven to one, um, student to teacher ratio that is, it's a contributing factor to its number eight ranking for best classroom experience by Princeton Review. So this scholarship opportunity would be ideal for anyone who'd like to gain a great books education at graduate level. And just briefly, I'd like to mention that one of our current Ramsey St. John's scholars, Ben Crocker, says of the program, and I'd like to quote him, that St. John's is a truly unique place. Its depth and breadth of learning, its teaching model and the quality and dedication of its faculty are outstanding. It's a radically traditional take on education, which is designed to refine your thinking and hone your reasoning skills in what St. John's deems the deliberately democratic classroom. So I've just given you a taste of the program there. If it is of interest to you, I encourage you to read more about it on our website. You can find links to the program there. And if you'd like to open a conversation with us about this opportunity or about our World Universities opportunity, you're very welcome to reach out uh, and by emailing us at postgrad at ramseycentre.org. I'll pop that email up on a screen later on. So, Speaking more broadly now for both categories of scholarship regarding our selection criteria, Ramsey scholars will be selected based on strength of character, demonstrated leadership qualities and commitment to serve others, in addition to outstanding academic achievement and also a commitment to advancing a richer and deeper understanding of our civilization. In your application, you will have the opportunity to reflect on what's distinctive about your proposed studies in extending or enriching your own appreciation of Western civilization and how you will achieve this. No one application or set of experiences are the same. So your ability to reflect on your personal context is key. You'll also be asked uh, in the application about how your proposed degree will assist you in inspiring others to appreciate Western civilization once your studies are completed. And as well as being able to demonstrate outstanding academic achievements, successful applicants have well-rounded experiences and commitment to service, which echoes what Mr. Paul Ramsey was famous for, and that is being a man for others. So I might just take the opportunity to share a few tips which may be helpful for this application but perhaps more broadly for other applications that you're working on. Before you start writing your application you may want to just read through the questions, reflect and practice articula articulating a few uh, major points that you'd like to convey in the course of your application. Think about your own points of difference, the unique experience that you've had and what you can offer as a Ramsey scholar. Also consider making it easy to read uh, without embellishment. Read your application aloud to get a feel for its tone and flow, even record it on your phone and listen back. The uh, panel is reading a high volume of applications, so the ease in reading yours will make a difference. 
Your application should convey neither arrogance nor meekness. Striking the right tone can be challenging, but try and demonstrate humility without diminishing your accomplishments. For example, you might like to discuss the scholarship as an opportunity not only for your own progression, but also for the benefit of others in your community. You can also share it with a trusted friend, colleague or mentor for a second opinion and do take note of their feedback. I recall one of the other presenters tonight mentioned um, that, you know, you should get someone to read it that isn't necessarily familiar with your line of research or work to make sure that it's easy to understand uh, by a variety of different uh, people with different educational backgrounds. Uh, once applications are open, you can open uh, an application in the portal and just save your progress as much as you like until the deadline. Or you can copy and paste the questions to a separate document, uh, but do keep an eye on your word count because you don't want any uh, surprises on submission day. Finally, and it's been mentioned here before as well, but it's a pretty good point. Don't leave your application submission until the very last minute. Be prepared to submit earlier than the final deadline to allow for any unexpected technical glitches which may indeed happen. You're very welcome to send us an email at postgrad at ramseycentre.org to start a conversation about what and where you're planning to study and um, whether the Ramsey Postgraduate Scholarship might be a good fit for you and you for it. So to stay connected with the work we do at the centre and to hear more about our current scholars, uh, you can follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube. Um, and now I would like to invite Dr Grace Borchert, who's currently in Oxford. If you're there, Grace, um, not sure if you're there. Hi, everyone. My name is yep. Grace Excellent. and I'm, I'm joining you from Oxford. I'm just recovering this morning after competing in several rowing regattas yesterday up in um, a little town called Bedford, which is good fun. Um, so today I hope to share some insight uh, into the Ramsey Scholarship, uh, why I applied, um, some lessons that I learned and also some advice for you to join us as well. So I'm really passionate about restoring sight, uh, whether that be clinically, through research or through not-for-profit organisations. And I applied to Oxford for an incredible DPhil project, um, which has the hope of restoring sight um, using gene therapy. Looking back on the early stages of the application process, I was very focused on um, what the project would entail, the aims, um, what experiments I'd do, and that, like the hope of um, improving quality of life for patients with a vision impairment. And then I had to shift that focus more towards uh, how to make that possible and happen. So through much reflection, um, speaking to mentors, advice from the Griffith Honours College, I considered various different scholarship opportunities. And after speaking to a friend who was one of the first Ramsey scholars, uh, who spoke very highly of the Ramsey Centre, and also advice from Griffith Honours College, I decided to apply for the Ramsey Scholarship. And so I hope to encourage you to also apply too. So I'll just start with a few um, reasons why to apply. Um, so the first, uh, the Ramsey community is uh, international in that you can be accepted to multiple different, um, so there's some Ramsey scholars in, in Harvard or Cambridge or Oxford or um, British Columbia. And each university overseas has its own expertise. So if your particular area of interest is um, has a center of excellence um, at Harvard, then uh, it's really fantastic that Ramsey is able to support uh, different um, different interests and a broad range of uh, specialities. It's also um, one of the most generous scholarships, which is the courtesy to Paul Ramsey. Um, and also the Ramsey community is very supportive and accommodating. Um, so to give an illustration of this, I, I finished my, um, it allowed me to finish my internship um, to get my full medical registration before commencing um, at Oxford. So I'm really grateful. And that was really important to me. Uh, so some lessons that I've learned from the process of um, going through the Ramsey and Oxford um, process was to prioritize, think about those three concentric circles in terms of um, why you want to apply and then how, and then what, what to do logistically. And I think um, the most important part is the why and spending the most time on um, thinking about 
how you hope to contribute to the wider society um, and make a difference in the future. And I think um, just in terms of taking the time to, to reflect on your experiences is really important. Um, think about the setbacks that you've had, but also the successes and what you've learned from both sides of the coin in terms of um, the bigger picture and, and what difference you hope to make in the future. And I'd just like to finish with a few pieces of advice. So I think firstly, the importance of speaking and discussing with supervisors and mentors. Um, everyone has their own um, advice and is always very helpful in terms of sharing that to, um, yeah, just to help along the journey. So at the moment, like I started uh, when I was applying to Oxford, had one supervisor and then by the time I was about to arrive, had three and now I have five. But everyone has their own um, expertise and has their strengths in terms of um, sharing their experience. And um, yeah, and, and really in terms of every step of the way, there's someone who can help and, and give advice, which is really useful. I think also it's important to take time to reflect. So I think that would be... Uh, another piece of advice. Life gets really busy, but it's important just to take time to pause and to um, to realise that it takes longer to um, than you generally expect. And, and it's also like Parkinson's law, where whatever time that you have, you're always going to fill it, um, no matter, yeah, no matter what. <laughs> um, and the third piece of advice would be to never give up. So when you're really passionate about something, um, then you'll find a way and and it will, yeah, you'll be able to put it into fruition. So I think that would be the final piece of advice. And I'm very happy to take questions and help however I can. It'd be wonderful for you to also join the Ramsey community. Thank you so much for that, Grace and Naomi. Um, does anyone have uh, any questions that they'd like to ask you, either Grace or Naomi about the, the Ramsey Scholarship? Um, please do feel free to post um, in the chat. Uh, Mariam straight on it. Um, uh, she asks, um, uh, it's the same question as before, um, sort of same sort of thing. So wants to, to, to study medicine, but is unsure, um, is a little bit concerned about applying for a Ramsey and getting accepted, but not getting accepted to university and vice versa. Um, is uh, the answer much the same um, as it was, it was outlined um, by Sarah or is um, uh, does Ramsey have a different uh, process for, for that sort of um, that sort of thing? Thanks so much for the question. Um, it's actually an eligibility criterion of ours to be accepted into a graduate program abroad before finalising your Ramsey application. So our application process is a little bit um, later than others um, in order to allow time for um, to receive letters of offer from your institutions of choice. You can actually list up to three institutions in order of preference from whom you've received letters of offer. Um, and so our application process closes uh, at the end of March. So it will close at the end of March next year, 2024. Uh, so uh, it's ideal to start your applications for your overseas institution, institutions of choice uh, later this year so that you have enough time to uh, receive your letter of offer by the time of the application portal closing. Um, Grace, would you like to share your experience about um, the application portal or anything add to that? Yeah. I found it fairly straightforward and, and smooth to use. There was a number of questions that you addressed and I found it helpful just to, um, yeah, just to write down and continue to sort of recraft and um, and sort of for it to take shape over time. Um, and then, yeah, there was just a number of questions and then the referees as well, which um, mentors just, you know, I think just reflecting on who would be um, good to comment on different aspects of um, to support the application. Mm. Yes, um, actually, I might just jump in and talk about the referees for a moment. Um, we are asking applicants to list up to three, uh, three referees, and um, at least one of them has to be able to speak and advocate for your academic ability. They don't necessarily have to be an academic, but as long as they can uh, vouch for your academic ability, that is ideal. The other two um, may be professional or um, character based. Uh, referees um, 
and so that's entirely up to you. But um, yeah, it was a good point that you mentioned before, Grace, about everyone has something to offer and um, it, you know, it's really important to take advice from from a lot of different um, voices and experiences and, and, and pick and choose what's going to work for you. A high school teacher, would a high school teacher be accounted for an academic reference? Um, perhaps you've graduated recently and uh, then you've had a bit to do with the high school teacher. Essentially, um, once you've completed your application or had a really good think about what you're putting forward in your application, you um, will probably get a sense of, oh, who do I know in my life that would best support everything that I've said here? And, you know, some of the extracurricular activities that you may have mentioned may have been from your time at high school or you might be contributing to your high school in a different capacity after your graduation. So they may indeed work for your context. And um, yeah, that's that's uh, fine for you. And if they can vouch for your academic ability, that's great. Um, any other questions, we're happy to take over email and um, I believe that there'll be some uh, question time at the end um, as well. Thank you so much, Naomi and, and Grace. Thanks for, for sharing your time this evening and uh, sharing your knowledge and experiences. It's really appreciated. Um, uh, yeah, thank, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to uh, hear from um, Anna Sterling. Anna is uh, the um, New Colombo Plan uh, Scholarship alumni, um, oh, sorry, alumni uh, ambassador to Griffith University. Um, she recently returned from her New Colombo Plan Scholarship and she's going to run us through her experience uh, as well as um, some aspects of the New Colombo Plan Scholarship. Um, hi, Anna, how are you going? Hello, how are you? Yes, okay, so I my name is Anna Sterling and I got the New Colombo Plan Scholarship in 2022 and but I left later because of COVID and the delays of that. Um, I am the 2023 NCP Alumni Ambassador for Griffith. So I'm in my sixth and final year of a Bachelor of Law and Government and International Relations. I did a semester at the National University of Singapore last year. And included in my scholarship program, I did one month of full-time Mandarin language training and I interned in a law firm in Singapore. And I was also able to do a bit of traveling, which I'll get to later when I talk about the experience in itself. I am a member of the Honors College and I'd like to say thank you to um, Victoria especially um, and Kim for their help in when I was applying many years ago for the scholarship as well. Cool, okay. So what is the New Colombo Plan? It is a signature initiative of the Australian government, which aims to lift knowledge of the Indo-Pacific in Australia by supporting Australian undergraduates to study and undertake internships in the region. So it's really wanting a two-way flow of students between Australia and the rest of our region. And yeah, it's a two-way flow where we can be engaging in the region that is very close to us and which is of primary importance to our nation. So it is intended to be transformational, deepening Australia's relationships in the region, both at the individual level and through expanding university, business and other links. So some key questions, who, what and where. So this is an undergraduate scholarship, so you can apply for it while you're doing your first degree, your undergraduate bachelor degree. Um, the actual New Colombo Plan Scholarship itself involves a period of study and often language training, internships and mentor mentorships. And there are so many countries in the Indo-Pacific region that you can choose to do your scholarship in. So I chose Singapore as my key country, um, but I've got a friend who is going to Vanuatu. Um, and you can see here in the list all the different countries that you may go to. So the New Colombo Plan Scholarship Program um, it provides about 125 scholarships annually to a diverse range of Australian undergraduates studying a range of disciplines in up to 40 Indo-Pacific locations. Um, so it doesn't just have to be for law students. I've got a friend who studies music, Julia, who is in Japan. Um, and this scholarship is valued very highly at up to about $60,000. And it's, it's prestigious and transformative. Um, it's an amazing scholarship to apply for. 
So it provides funding for you as an undergrad undergraduate student to do part of your degree overseas. So with my scholarship program, I'll just take you through a little bit about what that looked like. So for me, I did a semester um, of subjects in the international relations space of my degree at the National University of Singapore last year. And you can see in the top left, that's me with my Mandarin teacher. So we did some Mandarin training as well. Um, the middle bottom picture there is the campus at NUS. It was a beautiful campus to study at. And then I also interned at the Goodwin's Law Firm in Singapore. But there's more to the scholarship than just the more formal um, aspects of it there as well. I made a lot of amazing friends um, that I know that I will keep and continue to be in contact with. So I was able to network with law, um, people in the legal profession in Singapore. I was able to go to the High Commissioner's residence. So your High Commission will you can be engaged with in your country and connect to them as well. Um, so you can see an Australian Singapore Alumni Association Gala Ball that we went to there and then also made a lot of good friends there in Singapore. And also because there's quite a generous stipend for your monthly living expenses, um, you can go study, um, you can go explore the region and go traveling, especially in your uni in your university breaks. So I went to Vietnam, I went to South Korea and the Philippines and had an amazing time exploring the region as well. And I think Reese will touch on this one more, but there's also a smaller program called the Mobility Program, but I'm mainly focusing on the larger New Colombo Plan Scholarship tonight. Yes, and um, when you apply, it can be up to 18 months and you'll probably be more favoured in your application process if you can show that you're going to get the most out of your scholarship. So I would recommend um, thinking about internships that you might be able to have, mentorships, um, if you want to do language training and alongside your university study as well. So there's lots of opportunities for you to engage in the region and many people have gotten jobs out of this as well and have actually stayed in their host locations afterwards once they've finished their university degree. And another reason to apply for the New Colombo Plan, as has been said before, um, you become part of an amazing alumni program and the networks that you will be able to be a part of and participate in around Australia and around the region are really fantastic. So thank you, everybody. Um, I'll pass over to Reese, and we'll be very happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks so much, Anna. We'll um, take a few questions uh, uh, maybe at the, at the end of this section on the New Colombo Plan. Um, but it's really good to hear about your experience and um, the, the, the connections that you made while over there. Um, Anna mentioned uh, the difference between the scholarship and the mobility grant. So um, the New Colombo Plan Scholarship is um, specifically for undergraduate students um, who can apply and do six to 18 months abroad, as, as Anna mentioned. The mobility program um, is for uh, staff within the university, academic and sometimes professional staff, uh, to apply to create programs and projects that they submit to um, to the, uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, um, the New Col Colombo Plan team, um, and get assessed, uh, usually to take about 20 students um, overseas on a project uh, about around education or social enterprise um, or, or linked up with one of their uh, prerequisites. Uh, and uh, that, that's available, that'll, that opens at the same time as the New Colombo Plan Scholarship. Um, I'm just going to provide a link to the page for that. So if you are interested in that, we're focusing mostly on the scholarship today, but in the chat, there is a link there to the mobility grant if anyone is interested, any staff here are interested in, in pursuing that. Um, <clears throat> so the expressions of, the, the, there's a process at Griffith University around uh, how we go about um, uh, identifying um, New Colombo Plan scholars or potential New Colombo Plan scholars. Uh, unlike some of the scholarships we've heard about already this evening, uh, the New Colombo Plan scholarship um, doesn't really allow for direct application um, from students uh, or applicants to uh, the New Colombo Plan scholarship team. Uh, instead, uh, what's required is for the um, each university uh, around Australia to provide a list of 15 nominees. Uh, in 2023, it'll be uh, 15 nominees. Um, and uh, so they are selected by the university, by the Griffiths Honors College, um, and sent forward to to a um, new Col Colombo plan team for um, and DFAT uh, for assessment. 
So we've currently opened an expression of interest uh, form that's open now uh, and closes on the 20th of May. Um, you can, uh, that, that hyperlink in the slides, I believe you can open that if you just click up on, uh, click on that link in the slides that you can see now on the expressions of interest. Um, this expression of interest requires a lot of thought. It's not something you can just sort of open and do. Um, it's quite in depth and it mimics as much as possible the actual new Colombo plan application that successful expression of interest students will then have to undertake. Um, so 15 nominees, as I mentioned, will be selected by the university. Uh, and these students will be supported through the application process by the Griffith Honors College. Um, so if you um, put in a, a, an expression of interest, which requires an academic referee, an understanding of the project that you wish to undertake, um, a, a fairly decent GPA, uh, as well as extracurricular um, um, activities around you to, to provide a, a really good story of what it is that, um, uh, that you want to do and how the New Colombo plan will support you. Uh, and you are selected for that New Colombo, uh, as a, um, a New Colombo plan nominee for Griffith University, uh, the Griffith Honors College will then reach out uh, to those 15 nominees and support you in as many ways as possible to um, make your application as help you make your application as strong as possible. Uh, and to do that, we um, run a series of uh, a number of um, workshops to provide you support with crafting a CV uh, and an application um, specific to the New Colombo plan, um, as well as providing some uh, read through proofreads uh, and, and connections with uh, of the application and connections with um, a former New Colombo plan. Uh, scholars who will also support through that process and, and, and offer tips and ideas uh, as to um, how you can go through that process. It's a really end-to-end um, -end, uh, cradled and um, uh, supportive system to ensure that our um, 15 nominees have the greatest chance possible uh, when applying. And we have a history of success within the New Colombo Plan. Um, Victoria uh, Menzies is in the room, uh, took a leading role in supporting uh, in creating this sort of a process, which led to uh, 11 of our 12 nominees receiving a New Colombo plan last year. Um, so uh, we, we, uh, we also are on paper since the New Colombo plan uh, was established. Um, we have the highest number of um, scholar successful places uh, compared to any other university. So Griffith really knows what it's doing in this space. Um, so if you do want to have a good shot at it, I really, um, uh, really encourage you to apply by that expression of interest. We recommend that you have about five hours um, to commit uh, or per week to commit to an actual application. So if you undertake the uh, do submit an expression of interest, we ask that you are serious about that commitment if you are accepted, uh, because those who do become um, one, uh, nominees for the Griffith University will then have to undertake a lot of work to put together an application that um, is competitive. Uh, in, in a really competitive field um, within the New Colombo plan. So uh, our recommendation, broad recommendation, is that um, if you do get through that um, expression of interest phase and become a nominee, that you have the ability to put um, at least five hours aside each week throughout that application process, which runs for several months, um, to uh, revisit, add to, improve, think about, uh, talk to others about um, your application and how you can improve that to ensure that it's uh, the best possible product before reaching out to the New Colombo plan team. So uh, we've got a question there from Christopher about where you can apply for the expression of interest. Um, probably it, it's um, it linked within this uh, does the five hours include a workshop? Yeah, so that's where I'll come to this question in just a moment. Uh, probably the best way to, um, best starting point before putting in an expression of interest uh, is joining our new Colombo plan, Microsoft Teams. Um, so uh, it, within this Microsoft team, you'll receive information and support, um, hear about uh, a diff different workshops or, or ways to meet up with people um, that will support you in uh, uh, getting ready for the application or get, even getting ready for the expression of interest. We are providing some support um, to achieve that now. Uh, and um, you can schedule meetings with uh, the Griffith Hon members of the Griffith Honors College. Um, myself, uh, I've been chiefly taking on those meetings uh, within the GHC to support uh, Griffith Honors College students and students outside of the Griffith Honors College to consider uh, to begin their consideration of the New Colombo Plan um, scholarship process and start figuring out what it is that they'd like to do as part of a project, what's meaningful to them, what their story will be in this application, uh, and provide some tips and, um, uh, and ideas about um, creating a really strong um, expression of interest. 
another person that you can talk to is um, our Griffith's wonderful, um, prestigious uh, uh, scholarships coach, and that's Victoria Menzies. Um, and uh, she's another person you can reach out to via this team space. Um, this team space also allows you to connect with other applicants, which we believe is really beneficial to those who are applying. Um, uh, in all other rounds, Victoria assures me, in all other rounds, it's been a really collegial space where everyone's helped each other and really helped each other to grow. Even those who aren't, ex aren't successful in the EOI process have had such a, a useful and um, a collegial experience that they seem to get a lot from it and always learn a lot about applications and, and working as a, within a team to create um, uh, something of really high quality in this sort of a scholarship space. Uh, so we really recommend you join the team. Um, should have a link here. I'll, uh, I'll post a link in the chat in just a moment when I get, when I get a moment free. Um, but for the time being, does anyone have, um, if you have any questions, please throw them in and, and Anna and I will do our best to, to see how we can answer them. Um, Christopher asks, where can we um, apply uh, for expressions of interest? Um, so I'll provide that link in just a moment in that chat. Um, as well as the link to the Microsoft Teams um, space. Uh, and you can um, follow those uh, within that chat in just a moment to, to launch that application. As I say, it's not a matter of just clicking on it. Oh, thank you, Mariam. Thanks very much for that. So Mariam's just um, posted that uh, nominee um, expression of interest. It's not just about clicking that and, and applying. Um, it does require a little bit of thought and a few hours of work, probably several hours of work. Uh, and following up, um, figuring out what sort of plan you wish to undertake um, before actually applying for that. I'll also post the link in just a moment to, to that team space. Uh, uh, Miriam asks, does the five hours include the workshop? Um, five hours would be the five hours that we recommend if if you become a successful, um, if you become a, a new Colombo plan nominee, uh, we recommend that five hours as just putting together the application. That's talking to others about the application, thinking about the application and really um, uh, crafting it. It requires a lot of introspection um, and quite a lot of uh, uh, sort of pondering about what it is that you want to achieve. Um, and that leads to other things such as what is it that you actually want to achieve beyond this new Colombo plan and how will that prop you up? Uh, to, to support your, your goals and your ambitions beyond in and beyond university. Um, so as I say, it requires a lot of thinking about what it is you actually want. And I think uh, most of the students I've spoken to anyway about New, New Colombo Plan Scholarship, um, that's the first step for them, the first stage. Well, what is this actually going to help me uh, to achieve? Where does the New Colombo Plan fit in my life? And, and, and why is it that I want to go for it? What, what will it support me to do? So thinking about that helps you to come up with a really meaningful um, and authentic plan that you can pitch uh, to um, the New Colombo Plan team, to, to um, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and, and genuinely say, this New Colombo Plan will support um, me to succeed in future, which will be good for the country and the region. Um, so that's uh, a, a kind of the way to, to, to think about that. And that takes a lot of time, um, both in the, the introspective part, but also putting that on, on paper and um, crafting a story and crafting an application around that. Um, does the team's chat include the applicants that got scholarships previously? Not currently. Um, Anna, who uh, did receive a scholarship and is, is our, um, our alumni ambassador, under Colombo Plan Alumni Ambassador. She's in the chat currently, um, so you can reach out to her and, and talk to her in that space if you um, have any questions or, or wish to catch up in any way, shape or form. I believe, Anna, you were saying that you've been um, making yourself available to, to talk to New Colombo Plan, potential New Colombo Plan scholars, is that right? I'm very happy to chat to anyone who wants to talk about the scholarship. And I probably would just add on to say as well, like don't be, um, don't feel like you've got imposter syndrome and opt out and self-select and not try um, because everybody who applies um you you learn a lot about yourself in applying and um just i recommend go for it as i said before like not everyone knows if they're going to get it or not but just put your hat in the ring and have a shot great thanks emma i mentioned just earlier that the first step um before applying is to figure out what it is that you want um from the Col uh, new colombo plan scholarship and and what you want beyond that how it will help you forward but actually the first step is to figure out if you're um uh eligible for that and one of the key pieces in that as victoria mentioned just earlier uh within the chat 
is that you need to have the credit points available. So the New Colombo Plan Scholarship is about going overseas and undertaking study abroad, um, as well as an internship or internships um, at two, you know, within two locations um, uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Um, so you require those credit points. If you're on your last trimester right now, um, you're not going to be able to head overseas next year and undertake study because you'll be graduated. So um, having a lot of uh, electives is also really important. So if you've got a few electives in the bank at the moment, try and keep those if you're looking to apply um, because it's really, really important uh, uh, to, to use those while overseas and, and using up those credit points. Uh, so yeah, ensuring that you have a year, couple of years at this stage of university study left is an essential part of the New Colombo Plan Scholarship um, uh, application process because you need that time to, to actually spend abroad uh, while on scholarship. Uh, and as uh, Victoria mentioned, you can also undertake honours as part of your NCP program if you've organised that well enough. And it works for some disciplines better than others, others but it, it does work. Um, there's a few links there onto the teams now um, for people who've jumped onto that and a few links into the expression of interest as well. Um, does anyone else have any other questions before we um, move on from that? Great. Well, um, if you do have any further questions, please feel free to jump onto that Microsoft Teams space. Um, uh, you just have to request to be, uh, to be added and, and, and you'll be added uh, within 24 hours, probably less. Um, and in that space, you can ask as many questions as you like. We have all our staff there um, and our uh, alumni um, ambassador uh, sitting there ready to help out wherever possible. Uh, so please do join. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, it is for undergraduates, I'd argue, the, the best scholarship opportunity that is available to undergraduates in Australia. Um, and every NCP scholar that I've met who's returned home says it's the best experience they've had in their lives. Um, so really do, um, uh, it, it's such a worthwhile experience and absolutely worth the workload um, to, to, to undertake it. Um, uh, Miriam asked, do we get access to the slides? Absolutely, we'll be sharing these slides after the session this evening. Okay, um, thank you so much for your time. And uh, we'll move on now, be, uh, I'd like to introduce Victoria Mendes, um, former manager of the Griffith Honors College, and um, now prestigious external scholarships coach at Griffith University. Good evening, Victoria, how are you? Great, Reese. what about you? Doing fantastically, thanks. Um, I'll hand over to you and, and um, uh, yeah, can, can you run us through your new role and, and how you're here to help um, students okay. and, and staff to, to achieve our scholarships in the future? Now, the, I cannot express how valuable the NCP application process really is. If you get it, it's obviously even better going overseas and the experience, it will be transformational. But step one is that application process. Um, what we're going to talk about in this next section relates to all scholarships. Um, and so Reese is, and I are going to be responding about some of those. But for the moment, um, I'll share a little bit about my, what my role is. So you'll see that my title is Prestigious Scholarships Coach. So I've been working in this role for five odd years now. And what I've come to understand is the important role of coaching through this process. So all of you will understand a sporting coach. There really is no difference to um, what the role of a prestigious scholarships coach is. And so I'm there. Um, really for those that have made it through to the end process. So if you're a new Colombo plan, shortlisted candidate, I'll work closely with you to come up with a plan and then support you through that process. Griffith has an amazing network of people who um, put up their hands to assist through the application process and the interview process. But I see that we're running out a bit of time, so I'm going to hand back to Reese, and you can start asking a few questions. Great, thank you, Victoria. So we've got a couple of questions here uh, for you to, to run us through, to share your, your um, experience in this space uh, with this. So how do you write a persuasive application? Um, okay, now every one of these scholarships is different. That's step one. So the first thing is to start early and to make sure you do your research. So you've heard about a lot of different scholarships tonight and there are many more. If you get onto the website, there are other ones as well that we haven't even touched on tonight. So what you first need to do is to start really early and that can be a year in advance, six months, two months, but you need to start the thinking process, is this right for me? So start early, start talking to people about it, start finding out everything you can about that scholarship. 
every day become obsessed about it. That's what really the secret is for, for step one from my experience. Um, so understand what their requirements are. So New Colombo Plan is different from every other scholarship, scholarship and you need to really understand what are they asking you to do, okay? All of them vary. Make sure you answer the question. Now, last year we had um, Dr Peter Binks, who's Vice President of Industry Partnerships and Engagement at Griffith, and Peter was the CEO of the John Monash Foundation and has done many, many interviews. And one of the things he highlighted is how people fail to answer the question. So if you're coming along um, to a session that we're going to be running for the new Colombo plan, I'm going to give you a, a pre-example and a post, so draft one and draft about 10. So make sure you answer the question, okay? Um, tone is also really important. I use the word be authentic. A lot of people, it's just not authentic. What you think the panel is looking for is often not what they're looking for. They're looking for your heart. They're looking for your mind. They're looking for your curiosity, your sincerity. Don't try to be something that you're not. So what, that's one of the important kind of things to really do is to make sure that you are authentic. Look for your point of difference. What makes you unique? So you've heard Catherine Woodward speak and Grace Bushett. They are both med students. They both have very, very different um, points of difference, okay? Um, also understand what your narrative is. So if I work with you, I'll be talking about what is your narrative. Now, it doesn't matter about what the scholarship is. It's your narrative. What drives you? Narrative is what comes through as that thread that comes all the way through. So if you're passionate about climate change, it needs to be there when you talk about leadership, when you talk about academic excellence, when you talk about community, when you talk about the passions view. It comes through the whole time. So I work very closely as a coach with you to try and tease out, well, what is that narrative? And that comes all the way through. That's your point of difference. That's what the you want the panel to recall about you and to hold on to. The other thing is, what is really unique or innovative about um, what your research is or what you're proposing? So if you're looking at a Fulbright or a John Monash or Rhodes, what um, is your proposal? What is unique with your proposal? What is unique with perhaps the research you're doing? And in what way do you uniquely want to change the world? So you will have heard in every one of the presenters that talked about the scholarship they want to know about unique you, but they want to know about what you want to do that is going to make this world a better place. So Ramsey highlighted that, but also very strongly with Rhodes. Fulbright's exactly the same. So these are about what we might call ambassadorial things or, or soft diplomacy. It might be you, the US's um, uh, connection with Australia and you going to the US what way are you going to make the world a better place and strengthen Australia-US partnership? Um, it could be with John, Ash, John Monash, strengthen um, making Australia and the world a safer, better place for people, okay? So that kind of a persuasive application has all of those types of elements to it. Thank you. Next question, Rhys. So um, we've heard from uh, a lot of uh, members from different scholarship areas around uh, around the country and the world today, uh, as it's been mentioned also within the NCP about leadership and leadership being really important to demonstrate leadership or, or the capacity for leadership in the future um, when applying for, for a scholarship. Can you run us through, at least in terms of the NCP, what is leadership? Okay. And you would have seen in Rhodes, they use different language a little bit. And it you, that's where I say you've got to research. You've got to understand what is the question they're asking me here for this application, okay? So you're not putting in a grant and this is not an award. So it's very, very different what you need to do. So leadership for NCP, it's often a really about citizenship. Um, but leadership is a journey. And it depends on where you are at in your leadership journey. So 
for an undergraduate student, those of you who are here with us and you're thinking about New Colombo Plan, leadership for you is about in what way have you demonstrated, I say, leaderly actions. So it's not a title. I see students that will often do things like say, okay, I'm going to take on the role of president of my club and society, but they don't do anything. So um, you need to think about something like the STAR model. So what was the situation that I was in? What were the tasks that I undertook? What was the actions that I myself initiated? And as a result of those actions, what were the results? Okay. So leadership is not a title. It is really about um, actions that you have taken and impact. I take citizenship and leadership and I bring those two together because that's really what it's asking about. In something like Rhodes, when they talk about leadership, they're talking about are you going to be a future leader and change the world? Um, and citizenship is about community. So if you bring those two together, that's really thinking broadly about leadership. So know who you are, know what difference you want to have, what's the impact you want to have in the future to be a leader. Do your research about what do we mean by leadership? There are many, many, many models of leadership. So I've worked with quite a number of Indigenous students, for example, First Nations students, and we've really talked about Indigenous notions of leadership and what it means to collaborate. Lots of students have not taken on, for example, leadership roles, if you like, but they might find within teams that they're leaders. So people in Australia, we don't feel comfortable with this term leaders and leadership. You need to become comfortable with that. You need to know um, who you are as a leader and what your journey is and, and in what way you want to have an impact on society or the future. That's a critical thing to have. So understand yourself as a leader. Understand who are you as a leader and what model of leadership feels more comfortable with you, whether it's collaborative leadership, citizenship, citizenship leadership. So have a look at what are those different models and start to speak to that. Um, for NCP, DFAT is investing in future leaders that they see are going to change the world. Every one of these scholarships is about future leaders and changing the world and what impact you want to have. So that would be my strong suggestion there. So in what way do you want to drive change to have a positive impact on the world? Okay, so that's that's my suggestion there. It's about your impact and how you can have an impact on community. Okay. Thanks, Victoria. I think that's really helpful because it can seem like such a broad term sometimes and, yeah. and a difficult one to respond to. It's a hard uh, one. On that note, um, how do you write a strong personal statement? It's got to be authentic and genuine. Um, this is something that I suggest that you kind of do a stream of consciousness writing. So I suggest to people that every single day you write it. Where you start is not where you end. So Reese will be having for New Colombo Plans uh, ship scholars, um, will be having conversations with you and I will be having conversations with you. It's an iterative process. So you write it once, you write it again, you write it again and you write it again. All of the scholarships are exactly the same like this. So you need to write it from the heart. Um, it needs to be uniquely you, not someone else. You can't Google it online and see what you should be doing. It's got to be you. It's got to be your narrative, your heart. But it does need to have a vision. It needs to be about the world and what you want to change. So in some ways, it threads through all of the other aspects I've been talking about. What's the problem you see? How do you want to change the world and make it for a better place? So when we talk about a personal statement, that's not in the new Colombo Plan application, but it is in all of the other scholarships that you're talking about. So any of you as undergrads, if you're thinking about doing postgrad, you absolutely have to write a personal statement. The new Colombo Plan, I say it is really in your introduction. You need to introduce yourself because it's divided up into three aspects. So you've got to put in as an intro, like you do an assignment, you put in who are you, and what you want to stay. And that's almost your personal statement if it's two or three sentences. Um, a, 
Avoid absolutely focusing on um, accomplishment. A personal statement is not a CV. It's not a resume. You've got your LinkedIn and you've got your resume for that. This is about future. Okay, so it's got to be big, aspirational. It's got to engage. It's got to excite the panel. Panels are never the experts from your discipline. They're always average people from different kinds of areas. So do have a look at um, pitching it with other people. Talk about it every day. What is uniquely you? Ask people about you. What makes you unique? What makes you special? What are your strengths and things? Often it's talking to other people who will help you to find that. It is really hard and you've got to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. That's why for NCP, um, Reese mentioned five hours, any of these scholarships, every one of them, you've got to do a minimum commitment of five to ten hours a week. It's got to be your obsession. And the other thing I suggest is that you've got to have a mindset that you're going to do it no matter what. So if you're thinking about it as just something that, oh, I might throw my hat into the ring, forget it. You're unlikely to get it. You've got to live and breathe it. If you don't get it, you've got to say, I don't care. I'm going to do this anyway. That is the mindset that I find is how it breeds success. Um, the final thing I do want to say is often it's understanding your gaps. So if you're talking about leadership, know where your strengths are, but also know, and that's at starting early, if you are applying for something six months, eight months, a year out, You've got a lot of time to plan to say, well, where are the gaps in my application that I can fill those gaps? Even with New Colombo, you do have time to fill those kind of gaps. Um, and it may be useful to talk to Reese about how you might be able to fill them with leadership kind of uh, initiatives and activities or academic could be research experiences and things that you need to put in place. Okay, finish with that. Uh, so there is one final slide which has been up there and this is a slide that I put together last year about some of the kind of things that I think need to go in and um, I've, I've touched them all. You need a passion, you need vision for yourself but also for your field, you need excellence. That's not just academic, it's achievements as well. You need to be innovative and creative and think big and bold. Don't be shy to think big and bold. Panels get tired. If you're in the same puddle as everyone else, if you think this is what they're asking for, get out of that puddle. Think big, think visionary. Um, it is about collaborations and partnerships. So that's why with the NCP people would bring you together. But for Fulbright and all the other ones, in what way are you a leader nationally and internationally? Ambassadorial skills are really about this is representing Australia overseas. So every one of these scholarships you're going overseas. So are you an ambassador that's going to do Australia proud? Um, personality and adaptability. Are you going to cope if we go overseas? Do you have the, the resilience that you're going to be able to Pope overseas, and if COVID or something else hits, you can get yourself back here quickly. Uh, get feedback from people too. Okay, so with that, I'm going to finish up, and unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but um, please do feel free to reach out. For New Columbia, we're going to be having sessions where we'll be talking at greater length about it. So thank you for the invite to be here, Reese, and congratulations um, to everyone. Um, on the team, the, the uh, Honours College team who have organised tonight, as always, it's been a brilliant event. Thank you so, so much. Bye. Thank you very much, Victoria. And um, I feel as though we've just pierced the surface of your experience and knowledge in this space. So um, do do follow up on Victoria's offer to, to chat and to reach out uh, to her if you're, you're considering um, any of these uh, scholarships, uh, particularly the NCP, if, if that's something that you're looking to, to pursue. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for attending uh, today. Uh, we will be sharing out, as mentioned, um, we will be uh, sharing the uh, slides that we've been using throughout the session. There'll also be a recording available um, that will also uh, you can, you'll also be able to access um, after the session is wrapped up. Um, thank.
please do feel free to reach out if you have uh, any questions um, about the prestigious external scholarships. You can contact the Griffith Honors College email um, or any of the um, stakeholders that uh, or any of the, 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 the people who have come in this this evening and um, spoken to us about that. Uh, every one of the, the um, organizations who have spoken to us this evening are really responsive with their emails, always happy to help and, and um, clarify uh, any questions that you might have in terms of eligibility uh, or the process for application. And obviously Griffith is is always incredibly eager to help you with this process as well. So do feel free to reach out at, at any time. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening and uh, we hope you have a, a wonderful rest of the evening. Um, and if you are looking to apply for one of the scholarships we've discussed this evening or, or, or a scholarship outside of, of this scope, all the best, good luck, and please don't be a stranger. Get in contact and, and we'll help in any way we can. Um, that's it for us this evening. Thank you very much.